Salam everyone. Welcome back to Kalima Tayyiba series. Today is our second lesson and it's a very interesting one. I find it really useful, especially in the difficult times we're living in right now, when uncertainty prevails and when there's so much stress. So stay put. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala khayri mursaleen sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I'm going to start with a quick summary of last week's lesson so we refresh our minds. Remember last time we talked about our grandfather, Prophet Adam alayhi salam, and we talked about a jinn named Iblis. Allah ordered everyone to bow down to Prophet Adam, peace be upon him. So all the angels did, except Iblis. He was the only one who disobeyed Allah. We will go over the verses of the Quran that talk about this incident. illa Iblis. All of them prostrated, except Iblis. Allah asked Shaitan, what stopped you from prostrating to Adam, and I ordered you to do so? Shaitan replied, I am better than him. Now, Shaitan's answer is an interesting one. What's his mistake? Remember, we talked about the diseases of the heart, and one of them was arrogance. It's the belief of superiority. I am better than him. Now listen to the logic of shaitan, of why he thinks he's superior. He's giving his reasons to God and making up excuses of why he thinks he's better. Shaitan says, خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارِ You created me from fire. وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِنْ طِينَ And you created him from earth. Shaitan is saying, I'm fire and he's earth. So why are you making me bow down to somebody that I'm better than? Now a question for you. What kind of superiority did shaitan see in himself? Think about it for a second. I will repeat Shaitan's statement so you try and guess. I'm better than him. I'm made of fire and he's made of earth. What kind of superiority is that? It's material superiority, madda. He's being materialistic. He's looking at the actual substance of what we're made of and he's relying on that to conclude that he's better. This is his logic. And sadly, there are a lot of people who fall into that type of reasoning. Doesn't it happen to us sometimes? For example, in class, oh, I grasped the subject faster than she did, and I even got a higher grade. I must be smarter. Oh, look at him in sport class. He can barely run. I'm stronger than him. You visit your friend, and you see that she lives in a smaller house, and she has a very small room. You think in your mind, oh, look where she lives. I have a bigger house. I am more rich. Oh, my hair is nicer than his, and I'm taller and more beautiful. Oh, look what she's wearing. She doesn't have taste in fashion. I have designer clothes, and I'm more fashionable. This is arrogance, feeling superior for a materialistic reason. It's one of the major diseases of the heart, and it's the feature of shaitan, the devil. Don't these thoughts pass our mind sometimes? It happens to me, and I'm sure it happens to a lot of you. Okay, so now we know what arrogance is and that we might catch that disease on several occasions when we feel we're superior or better than someone. And I know you're thinking, okay, now we know the problem, but you need to tell us how to fix it. And you're right. We need a solution for it because we fall into that trap very frequently. So what's the solution for arrogance? There are actually two solutions, or better yet, I'll call them cures. So there are two cures for the heart disease called arrogance. I will use the same examples as I did now, but with a new twist. And I want you to try and guess what the two cures for arrogance are. Oh, I grasped the subject fast in class, and I even got a really high grade. Alhamdulillah, thank God, this is a blessing from him. He made me smart. Oh, I feel really energetic and active in sport class. This is a blessing from Allah. He made me strong. Thank God I have a beautiful house and a big room. Allah made me rich, and hopefully I will thank him for these blessings and donate or share some of the money he gave me to less fortunate people. Oh, I'm having a great hair day, and I feel so beautiful. Alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah. Allahumma kama hassanta khalqi, fahassin khuluqi. Oh Allah, just as you perfected my look, also perfect my character. By the way, this is a tip for the girls and the boys. Memorize this dua or supplication and say it whenever you look at yourself in the mirror. Because Allah promised that whoever thanks him for a blessing, he will increase it for him. So basically, if you want Allah to preserve your beauty and even increase it for you, 
Say that supplication or dua every time you see yourself in the mirror and you will become more beautiful from the inside out. So, did you guess the two cures? First cure, no comparison. Don't compare yourself to others and do not look down on others because this is a door for shaitan. It's a door to arrogance. He wants you to feel superior for something that you don't even own. Okay, you're, you are smart and you got an excellent grade, but who gave you the ability to understand fast? It is Allah. You could have easily been in the place of the person who is slow and can't grasp fast, but no, Allah picked you and gave you that blessing. So don't look down on others and feel superior, just like Shaitan did. Yes, you are strong, you're beautiful, and you have great hair days, great clothes, and a beautiful house. Who gave you all of these? Did you earn the right to have all those beautiful things? No, really you didn't. None of us did. They're just pure blessings from Allah. We didn't do anything to deserve them. And we could easily have been on the other side of the story. Yet, Shaitan whispers to us and lets us think we're better for something that we don't even own. Yes, you don't own your smartness. You don't own your beauty, your strength, your money. It's all a gift from Allah. And just like he gave it to you with his name Ar-Razzaq, the provider, he can take it all away from you with his name Al-Mana, the withholder. So don't compare yourself to others and don't look down on others. And when you see someone or when you see the misfortune of someone, instead of looking down on them and feeling superior, one should repeat this dua. And it's very important, so write it down and memorize it. Alhamdulillah, الذي كفاني هذا البلاء وفضلني على كثير ممن خلق تفضيلا. It means, praise be to Allah who has kept me safe from this affliction and preferred me over many of those whom He has created. Allah promised us that when we see someone less fortunate than we are and we say this dua instead of looking down on them, Allah promised us He will keep us safe from that calamity no matter what it is. That's why it's really important to memorize it. Now, what is the second cure for arrogance? Anyone guessed it? Be thankful to Allah because he showers us with blessings that we don't even deserve. You're smart, beautiful, strong, artistic, good with people, funny, good with computers. Each one of you now, think of, think of a quality that you have. You didn't do anything to earn that quality. He just gave it to you out of generosity and kindness. He made you smart, strong, beautiful, and rich. So don't ever claim that blessing to yourself and always return it to him, to him and say thank you, alhamdulillah, that he has given me that blessing. Even when you answer correctly in class or come up with a brilliant idea or do an excellent project, don't think highly of yourself. Don't brag and boast about it, not even to yourself. Recognize that it is Allah who made you do it. Now I know you're thinking, so I should not be happy and proud for doing something good? My answer to you, of course you should be happy. Let me tell you something. If you are an average person and you are in a forgetful or heedless state, then you'll be happy about your achievement. However, if you are a true believer, you'll be conscious of Allah. So you'll be extremely happy, but not about your achievement or good quality. But, but about the fact that Allah gave it to you. You see that nuance, it makes a lot of difference. And if you think this way, I promise you'll enjoy a much higher level of happiness, way nicer than the other one. And if you don't believe me, go try it for yourself. Practice to start enjoying your blessings and your good qualities because Allah gave them to you and you'll feel the difference. Allah mentions in the Quran, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ Allah is telling Prophet Muhammad to tell us, tell them Muhammad that they should be happy and rejoice with what Allah has given them. Be happy with the favors and mercy of God. It's better than letting shaitan trick you by boosting your ego. There's a really nice post that I came across. Six important guidelines in life. Listen to them. When you are alone, mind your thoughts. When you are with your friends, mind your tongue. When you are angry, mind your temper. When you are with a group, mind your behavior. When you are in trouble, mind your emotions. When God starts blessing you, mind your ego. You see this last point? That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to give you an example that actually happened with me just a couple of days ago. So when I meet someone for the first time, 
the first thing that attracts my attention is the mouth area and the teeth because I'm a dentist. So I meet that person and I was like, oh my God, look at her, look at her teeth. Doesn't she know how to use a toothbrush? And her gum is all red and her teeth are yellow and stained. And you can even see she has some missing teeth, bad breath and very bad or oral hygiene. You know, I was really repelled. Subconsciously, I immediately felt that sense of superiority, that feeling that I'm better than her. The thought came to my mind, I accepted it, and it passed. And then subhanAllah, I was preparing this lesson, and I realized that I had fallen in, in the devil's trap. If Allah willed, I could be the one in her shoes. If Allah removes that blessing from me, my teeth would be like hers, maybe even worse. And I felt ashamed from God because I used one of his blessings to feel superior to someone he has created. So I memorized this dua, the one I just told you about, and I asked Allah to help me repeat it every time I see someone less fortunate than me. First, to keep my heart in check, make sure I don't feel arrogant or superior to someone he has created. Second, because Allah promised me if I repeat this dua, he will preserve my blessing and protect me from losing it. And when I felt that I was better than that person with bad breath, the problem is, is that I didn't give it much thought. I didn't even know that I did something wrong. The thought just crossed my mind and it passed. That's why most of our times we are in a state of heedlessness, which means inattention to Allah and his blessings. We just think, yeah, I'm smart, yeah, I'm better. And we forget who the actual provider is, Allah. And if you remember in our last session, I told you the importance of dhikr, the act of remembering Allah, the importance of prayer, attending those lessons, understanding the Quran, the book of Allah. Because without these practices, we will stay in that forgetful state and shaitan will keep winning by making us fall into his traps. And you see how smart he is? He's not an easy enemy, so don't underestimate him. He whispers those thoughts and he makes you think that they are normal. It's normal that you feel you're better than her. Don't you see what she's doing? Don't you see how she looks? And you're like, yeah, I'm better than her. You see how subtle he is? When I was in school, there were two activities that I really liked, chess and football. One activity for the mind and the other for the body. And I used to enjoy both because I'm a competitive person. When you have a chess game and you want to win, you must prepare really well. There are different strategies and tacti tactics to attack your enemy. Protect your king, control the center, develop all your pieces fast, don't move your queen too soon, don't move the same pieces multiple times, etc. Those who know chess will understand what I'm talking about. And you have to spend a lot of time practicing to conquer the, the game. The same goes for football. I remember how we used to gather around the coach at halftime to discuss the opponent's weak points and how to increase our defense and boost our offense to win the game. I remember our coach used to carry a small board and she would start writing all over it to explain to us our positions and how to move on the field to win the game. Think about it for a second. If you put this much effort to understand the tactics and strategies of our opponents in a worldly game, so we, would, so we would win and come back with a trophy, shouldn't we spend at least the same amount of effort to know our real opponent, study the tactics and strategies of our real enemy, Iblis? Because I've told you he's a strong opponent. He's really subtle. He's good at his game. It's actually his life mission to try to bring as much people with him to help. So guys, now you know who's your real opponent, who's your real enemy. So we need to buckle up and start to take things seriously because we want to win our trophy and graduate from Earth to re-enter our sweet home paradise. That's why our lesson today will be about the different techniques and traps of shaitan and how to fight them. So we're gonna study the tactics of our enemy to know how to build our defense. When Allah asked us, Banu Adam, which means the children of Adam to live on Earth, he didn't just leave us to figure out things for ourselves. No, he sent us prophets, Rusul, to guide us. The first prophet was Adam, peace be upon him, and the last prophet was Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam. In between Adam and Muhammad, peace be upon them, there were many, many other prophets, and we'll talk about them, inshallah, in other lessons. Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is the most amazing human being ever created. He's our role model. Once he gathered the Sahaba, his companions around him, he took a stick and he started drawing on the sand. You know, this incident reminded me of when we gathered around the coach who started drawing on the, on the board during the football game. Anyway, the prophet took a stick 
and he drew a straight line in the sand. And he said to his companions, this is the straight path of Allah. Then the Prophet drew lines to the right and left, and he said, these are the paths of misguidance, on each of which is a devil inviting people to follow. It. Then the Prophet recited this verse, this is the straight path of Allah. فاتبعوه, so follow it. And do not follow the other path, so you deviate from your way. That is his command to you in order that you may be conscious of Allah. When you say in Surah Al-Fatiha, guide us to the straight path, you're asking Allah to guide you to that straight path so you can reach the end and win the trophy. Iblis doesn't want us to walk on that straight path. He wants us to deviate from it. So what does he do? Iblis said, What does that mean? It means I'm going to sit on every corner of that path and lurk in ambush for them. I don't want them to arrive to the end. Shaitan continues, then I will come to them from before them and from behind them and on their right and on their left and you will not find most of them grateful. This verse summarizes all the tactics of Iblis. If you understand it, we know how to overcome his tricks and not fall into his traps. I will start by explaining the first tactic. Shaitan is saying which means I will come upon them from before them, which means from the front. The front means the future. He wants us to be scared from the future. So he starts whispering to us thoughts of uncertainty and negativity. What will happen to you in the future? Are you going to make it? He wants to stress you. When things aren't known or certain in the future, it creates room for possibilities. You can either have trust in Allah and have tawakkul, which means belief that he will care for you and provide for you, just like he's been doing since the day you were born. Or you can invent ways those possibilities will not work in your favor. And Shaitan definitely wants you to go with this option. He even whispers to you creative ideas of how things can go wrong, and you start to worry even more. There are many uncertain things in our lives, and he wants us to worry about them. Worry excessively to the point that we feel anxious and stressed out. He wants us to fear the future and have doubt in Allah. He wants us to think that the whole world is falling apart and everything is out of control. So you'll be chilling at home, minding your own business, and suddenly you, you start getting thoughts of the scary future. What's going to happen to me? Am I going to get a good grade? Am I going to fail? I won't be able to get the score I need for uni. I'll have to repeat my class, and I'll never find my dream job. I haven't seen my friends for a while now. Will they forget about me? Am I going to end up all alone with no one to talk to? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to catch corona? Am I going to go to the hospital? Am I going to die? What if my dad loses his job? Then we'll drop out of school and leave our house and we'll be homeless and poor. Never allow yourself to fall into this line of thinking. Say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. I seek refuge in Allah from the outcast Shaitan. Know that it is Shaitan who's trying to scare you from the future. These negative thoughts are all in your head, they are not real. Have trust that Allah will provide you with everything you need, just like He always does. So what, what you need to do when you start to feel anxious because of all the negative thoughts, first is stop and think, no, this is shaitan. I'm going to fight the urge to continue with, with these thoughts because they're not true. They are wahm, which means illusions. Nothing will happen to you. Shaitan can't hurt you. His weapon is simply illusion. It's not real. And if you think about it this way, you'll know that he's weak. If you know his weapon and know how to fight it, he becomes weak, very weak. Understanding the problem is half the solution, actually the most important half. Know that you are stronger than him and don't worry about the future because you have trust that Allah will provide you with what is best for you and you'll immediately feel relieved. Why? Because when you remember Allah and his strength and his power, his kindness and mercy, your heart will be at peace. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul the hearts get reassured with the remembrance of Allah. So the trick of shaitan, he wants you to fear the future so you become anxious and stressed. The solution is to have trust and tawakkul, which is confidence that Allah will provide you with everything you need, 
because he controls everything, not shaitan. So Allah won't leave your side. Be optimistic. Good things will happen. Fight shaitan and let yourself imagine the best. Have confidence that God is by your side. I'm with you wherever you are. Even if you're facing a problem and you're finding difficulty to solve it on your own, before you ask anybody for help, ask the one who can actually help you, Allah. Make dua or supplication. By that you'll establish a connection with the creator of everything, with your creator. And by the way, when you make dua to Allah, you can use whatever language you want. And I promise you, when you say in your supplication, Oh Allah, I have this problem. I have no idea how to solve it or fix it. I'm putting it all on you, full trust in you. And I'm confident you will help me. If you say that with the belief that Allah is the Almighty and that he has the strength to change whatever he wills, and make things better, there's no way that he won't answer your call. And there's no way that you won't feel relieved after that. You know why kids are happy most of the time? Because they don't worry. They never stress. Why? Because they know and they are sure that their parents are always taking care of them. And if a problem comes up, they don't care because their parents will help them solve it. We need to be like kids. We have to know that someone is always taking care of us and it's Allah. And if a problem comes up, we shouldn't worry and become anxious because we know that Allah will guide us through it. Just like the kid knows his parents will help him when he needs them. Imagine you're going on a road trip with your parents. Do you worry if the car has enough gas or what road you're going to take to arrive to your destination? If the weather is good enough? If the car stops mid-road, what would you do? If you have enough money to buy food for everyone? No, you don't think of any of that because you know that someone else is thinking for you. Your mom and dad are taking care of all those questions and issues and you have full trust that they will take care of you along the way. All you have to do is be happy and enjoy the road trip. You see how these kids are enjoying the trip and relying on their parents for everything? That's how we should go on with life, relying on Allah. That is why Allah tells us to remember him just like we remember our parents when we need something. Call upon Allah just like you call upon your parents or even more. Okay, now let's go back to the verse of Shaitan's tactics. I will sit on the right path to try and deviate their way. Then I will come upon them from the front. Now we know what it means. Now I'll explain the second tactic. And I will come from behind them. If the front means the future, behind means what? The past. He wants us to live in the past. He wants to remind us of everything bad that happened to us. He wants to remind us of all our tribulations, all the hardship, all the hardships that happened to us. So we get depressed. We all know that we can't change the past. We can't do anything about it. The past is in the past and what happened is done. Yet, he wants, to keep, he wants us to keep dwelling on things we can't change, to put us down. He wants us to start using the word, what if? What if I didn't do that? What if I went there? What if, what if? And you start replaying bad scenarios in your mind and what you could have done to avoid them. And you feel regret, ashamed, sad, and maybe you start to cry. Lo, what if, is from shaitan because he wants you to dwell and live in the past. The solution, same as before, easy. Identifying the problem is have the solution. Know that these are shaitan's whispers. Say, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim This will help you stop those thoughts from running in your head and start to shift your thinking. You need to know with certainty that whatever happened to you in the past is good for you. Well, actually, this is not very accurate. It's not only good for you, but it's actually the best thing that could happen to you. And when you believe that, your heart will feel so much better. Now, I know you're thinking, if something bad happened to me in the past, how do you want me to believe that it's actually good? The fast and incomplete answer to that would be that those past experiences made you who you are today and made you more experienced and more mature. But that's a shallow answer, and there's much more to that. And in the coming lessons, inshallah, if God's willing, I will explain to you in detail how to believe that whatever happens to you is the best thing, even if it looks bad. This is a nice illustration or summary of our lesson today. When shaitan comes from the front, he wants us to worry about the future, so we feel tension, stress, and all forms of fear from uncertainty. When shaitan comes from behind, he wants us to worry about the past, 
so we feel guilt, regret, sad, unforgiving. Shaitan is the producer of negative thoughts, and negative thoughts are heavy. You see how this creature, I think it's an ant, it can barely hold all those rocks. They are heavy rocks, and they're weighing the ant down. There's a saying in Arabic, hmol khafif, carry a lightweight, live in the present. Because if you're depressed, you're living in the past. And if you're anxious, you're living in the future. And if you are at peace, you're living in the present. You see all these heavy rocks that you carry? I want you to just throw them and have trust in Allah. Have tawakkul. Before I end this lesson, I'm going to teach you a small form of meditation to help you live in the moment and be at peace. God, Allah, has an infinite number of names. We can never know them all because they are infinite. The names of Allah are called Asma'illah al-Husna, the beautiful names of Allah. In our life on earth, Allah wants us to understand and live by only 99 names of his. So he has an infinite number of names, but he told us if you want to graduate from earth, to return to heaven, we need to study, understand, and live by 99 names of his. So our purpose in life is to get to know Allah by understanding his names. Now, what does this have to do with our meditation? Let me explain. If you want to meditate, First, you need to be sitting in a quiet place, phones away, so you can focus. It's just a five minute exercise, so I need all your attention. I want you to repeat La ilaha illallah 100 times. La ilaha illallah means that there's no God except Allah. So let's say you had a fight with someone, could be anyone, one of your siblings, your friend, your parent, and this issue is bothering you. It's a heavy rock you're carrying in your mind. I want you to visualize that rock and when you say la ilaha, I want you to throw it out of your mind, out of your system. And when you say illallah, I want you to replace that rock with the name of Allah in your heart. Allah who is as salam, the giver of peace. So technically, you're repeating la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. And while you're doing that, you're removing what's bothering you from your system and replacing it with trust that Allah will help you work things out with that person because he is as salam, the giver of peace. This is one of his 99 names. Another example. Someone is bullying you at school or online, and you did everything to deal with it, but still this problem is bothering you, and you keep thinking about it. When you say la ilaha, you throw that bullying issue outside your system, imagine yourself throwing it out, and when you say illallah, you remember his name, al muhaymin the guardian. Allah is my guardian, and he will guard me from any harm. You're thinking of your final grade at school, and it's really important to you because it might affect your uni application. And you keep thinking about it, and it's making you anxious. Say la ilaha and throw that rock out of your system. And when you say illallah, remember the name of Allah, al rafa the elevator. He will elevate your grade or your rank, and you'll feel so much better that you're asking Allah to take care of all your worries. Now, there's a very important issue that you need to understand. Tawakkul is a state or a feeling of the heart that is accompanied with action. So when I tell you to have trust in Allah with all your issues and problems, that does not mean that you don't work and do your best to fix them, not at all. This would not be tawakkul, but tawakkul, and they are the opposite. Because Allah told us to try and fix things and try to solve our problems in the best way we can. But at the same time, in our hearts, we have to have confidence that he will help us. You understand the nuance? Because it is really important. So you can, for example, go out on the street and say Allah is al-hafiz, the protector, so I'm not going to wear a mask and I won't catch corona. This is tawakul, and it's totally, it's totally wrong. Allah asked you to wear the most protective mask and do all preventive measures against corona with, with your body. But in your heart, he wants you to know that he, Allah, is the protector, al-hafiz, and not the mask. And this is tawakul. Now, I know you might tell me, I don't know all the names of Allah. And even if I read them while I do this meditation to find the right name that corresponds with my problem, it will take me forever. And you said it's a five minute meditation and you're right. So I have two solutions for you. First, you need to know that the name Allah combines all his other names. So by simply saying la ilaha illallah, throwing your problem when you say la ilaha and putting Allah in your heart when you say illallah, it would be more than enough. Second, I want you to read the names of Allah every day. Go through the list. It would not take you more than five minutes. I told you, if you want to graduate from earth and enter paradise, the only chapter you need to understand is the names of Allah. Because Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us, Allah has 99 names, and whoever knows them will go to paradise. So these names are your ticket to paradise. 
So I promise it's worth it to read them once per day. So this is the end of our lesson today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, you can contact me using the following email. It's down on the slide. And in the beginning of our next lesson, I will answer you. In our next lesson, inshallah, we'll continue with the strategies and tactics of shaitan. See you next week. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.